Okay, this is Vince. Okay, and the only people that are going to be really able to collect on them are the students that are here. Basically, because the, the long term bets, you're going to see what's happening, but they're going to be living and they're going to be affected by it. We have uh, perhaps some investment opportunities if, it, if you want to think about it that way. But how we got started out to, to Silicon Valley is I am in a forum group, and it was, uh, we got together about 38 years ago. We were all in the Young Presidents Organization. And they were encouraging people to get into smaller groups uh, of 12 or so. We did that. We started meeting, you know, once one afternoon a month for, for quite a while, talking about our, our business issues and business problems. But there, there was no competitors in, in the group. And then, uh, as as things grew, we we decided to take a few re some retreats and get out of town. And and then uh, for the last probably 25 years we've been going on one or two retreats a year, always one about the end of January. And the people in this group are, are pretty well connected. And we've always gone someplace where a person knows somebody who can help us and we've had excellent programs. But then we decided we wanted to go to Silicon Valley and no connections. And they looked at me because I'm kind of the secretary of the group and set something up. Well, I, I found a company out there that's willing to, to, to basically set up programs or corporate boards and even engineers that come to town and want to learn about different uh, types of businesses and so forth. So uh, we, we set this up uh, going out to Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is, is not a valley. Okay. It's basically the area, and it kind of, it's not a town or a government jurisdiction. It's basically the area from San Francisco down to San Jose. You can argue about it whether it's on the east, east coast of the bay or not. But why it's Silicon Valley? Silicon was a key uh, ingredient, which is basically sand, the chip of sand, of the computer chip. And that's really what got this whole area started. And I think why it ended up also in Silicon Valley in California is that Hewitt Packard had an office out there, IBM had a big research center, and Stanford University uh, was in Palo Alto, which is about in the middle of that. A lot of the technical people that are in Silicon Valley are graduates of uh, Stanford University. Uh, this just shows, I don't know, the hundreds of, of companies that, that are tech-related and computer-related. Lots of big names in here, lots of, lots of them we, we haven't heard. But I would say most of the big companies are, are have offices out there because they want to know what's happening. Um, this is Apple headquarters. And we found that the each company has different personalities. Okay. This is Apple headquarters. They call it a spaceship, a nickname in town. This is the spaceship. It was Steve Jobs' idea, and it, it's all green, a green building, and they're taking the wind in and circulating it through, through the air conditioning system. It, just entering, my wife said, well, where is the parking? Well, it's all underground. There's an entrance right here. But <coughs> Apple also has a different personality. And it goes back to the early days when uh, Steve Jobs was working with Bill Gates. And actually, Microsoft wrote a lot of their early software for Apple computers. But uh, Jobs thought that Gates stole some proprietary information. So he passed the rule, no outsiders, no visitors in an Apple facility. So. Uh, we couldn't get in there, but what you can do is you can go across the street to the Apple Visitor Center, and you can go up on the roof and look at, look over there and see a little corner of, of the spaceship. But they're also happy to sell you Apple computers and iPads and telephones you know, down below. Uh, another company that's, that's very different, completely different personality is, is Google. And we went over and had a presentation you know, by Google. And 
They welcome visitors. They like to have them come in. We're, we're in, in, the, in our conference room. Uh, the presenter is very interesting. He was a Russian. And he had danced at the Bolshe um, Ballet, and I have that probably pronounced wrong. He's a ballet dancer. And then after a few years, he decided there wasn't much future in that, and went and got his PhD in theoretical physics. And he'd been at Apple 15 or, 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 or I mean, at, at uh, Google 15 or, 15 or 20 years. But in his presentation, he talked about all kinds of stuff. We, we asked him, OK, Five years from now, you know, what will be different? Came back in five years, what's, what's going to be different? It's voice recognition and self-driving cars. Inter inter interesting. And, and he said voice recognition, you will not be entering data. You know, you'll be, be you know, talking ver verbally into it. That's coming with my iPhone. I can, I can tell it what to do these days. Uh, Another place we went, and, and it wasn't on our schedule, but our tour guide knew it was there, and we walked in, and he arranged the person to give us a, a presentation. I think the guy was sitting behind the desk, and we all said he didn't like what he was doing, so he came up and gave us a presentation. But Singularity University is not a university. It's basically a consulting group who bring experts in from Silicon Valley, depending on what the customer wants, and... Um, um, looks at what's going to happen you know, in, the, in the future. And they talk in here, I want to they explore opportunities and implications of exponential technologies connected to global, global echoes. Exponential means not linear, but it's going up like a rocket ship. Uh, and that's the building that is in an old Air Force base. That's one of our, our members. And uh, all of us are in their 70s or 80s you know, right now. But I told him I wanted him to stand next to that because it, I could show the picture and he'd be esteemed, an esteemed, well-known person. Um, so they're talking about ex exponential you know, change and so forth. Well, didn't have a lot of time, but he had one, one thing that uh, kind of rang the, rang the bell. And, in, and I, I went back to my notes. I remember what he said, but I didn't know if it was 20, 50, or 50 years. Your students can, you know, correct, come back and tell us, you know, in 2050, if this is right. But electricity, he said, will be free. I changed it to, to cheap because what you're doing is getting, you know, you're not going to be using oil. It will be all non-fossil fuels. It will be wind, which is free. It will be solar, which is free, except for the equipment. It will be hydro, which, which is free. Uh, the, the only cost is, is the transmission. You know, that made us think a little bit, uh, big time. Why, what are the implications of, of this? Uh, and these are a couple clippings out of the uh, recent newspapers. Uh, I can't, I, this was within, these are all within the last month or two. Uh, I'm going to come over and just read it so you want to see it. But this is Governor uh, Waltz, wants Minnesota electric power would be completely green energy by 2050 to reach the goal that remains a puzzle. You know, how they're going to reach it, they haven't figured out yet. But that's, you know, 30 years and it's a long time. And, and uh, uh, the editorial is saying, Waltz has set an ambitious goal of going carbon free by 2050 and Minnesota can do it. Uh, the, the, the next one is uh, this is last Sunday. No, this was uh, March 12th. Okay. But the cost for new energy productions drop. Wind and solar continue to decline in cost. And I think think you might be seeing that in the cost of the and, uh, Rick and Rick's sons are in the solar energy business, and costs are going down. So that's uh, one one of the the five take homes is energy is going to be free and. Uh, 30 or 50 years. Another stop we made was the Ford Motor Company, who is, has got a development uh, center, about 200 people in Silicon Valley. They also have uh, development centers in, in Dearborn, Michigan, and I think in Europe someplace. But they put this out here because the people in, 
in Dearborn don't think computers. They think metal stamping machines and everything. So these guys are out here in the uh, uh, Ford that's the president of the co company that comes out and visits them on this. But what is, is also kind of unique, I think, and it, it rings some bells when you have to see this, is that they've got uh, charging stations for electric cars out front. And I don't see a meter on there or any place where you put your credit card. So probably getting them charged is, is, is free. So we got in there and asked the same question. Five years, what's going to happen? Well, electric vehicles and self-driving cars. Okay, let's take a look at that. This is, and, and you know, this rang some bell, because I, I know electric vehicles hadn't done very good. You know, they've been out, the, the Chevy's Volt didn't do good. The, um, I don't think there's any 100% electric vehicles that have done good. The hybrids, you know, the Honda, I mean, excuse me, Toyota has a hybrid that, that, that's, that's done pretty good. But this is uh, Ford Motor. Okay. They're, they're going to revamp a plant in Michigan for to have electric cars out in 2023. Three and a half years from now, probably. Would. And given our accelerated plans for fully electric vehicles. It's not a hybrid, they're going, going fully electric, which is also surprising. And they basically have taken a fresh look at the growth rates of electrified vehicles, and we think that's, that's going to happen. Um, going back, General Motors plans to launch, launch 20 new all electric, all electric vehicles by 20, 2023. Two of which will be introduced in the next, next 18 months. Okay, now I don't know exactly when that announcement was made. General Motors believes in an all electric future. Uh, uh, although the future won't happen overnight, it's, it, 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 it's, it, it's coming. It's, it's going to come. Uh, and they're basically, there's a little salesmanship, you know. General Motors is committed to driving increased usage and acceptance of electric vehicles through no compromise solutions that meet our customer needs. So they're going to meet your needs. Another statement here, which you got to say, unlike other automobile makers such as Daimler, Volkswagen, Volvo, GM is not committing to a broad electric, electrification of its portfolio. These companies are going to be all electric, not having any internal combustion energy. <coughs> General Motors is going to have both. So that's, um, and doing a little bit of internet research, um, by 2040, <coughs> it's projected that most, uh, almost 60% of new U.S. cars will be, will be electric. And that's, you guys can remember that and come back. If you can't find me, I'll be in the cemetery. <laughs> 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 and, 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 and this bottom line here is, is what's going to happen if you don't go green. There's no 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 cost savings. Well, things are things are going to go up. Go up. But you don't see like the uh, like this an economy for town like gas stations and things like that. But what changes might take place? In well, it's going to change. But and I go back to this. I was doing some things in, in my head right. Now. <coughs> In the U.S., there's about 17 million cars sold in a year in the last 10 to 12 years. So, and this, uh, 40 percent of those will be internal combustion; the other will be electric. So, and then there's all the cars that are rolled that are 10 years, you know, between zero and 10 years. So, it's going to be at, at that time maybe 10 percent, you know, of the cars on the road, maybe 15, but. You're still going to have to have some, some filming stations. My brother works for Quick Trip as a mechanic, and they sent him to school. This is a five, over five years ago. And he retrofits, retrofits the semi trucks to run on natural gas. <coughs> and they, so the Quick Trip trucks that also outside uh, trucking agencies and so forth bring that in too. So they're already cha making some big changes there. Well, my, my neighbor is, is a. Uh, covers half the country in, in finding real estate locations for Valvoline 
rapid oil change. And the, the brass that fell the lean is getting a little worried. That apparently they're seeing some of these numbers. And, oh, no, no. Um, and actually, one of the guys in our group actually founded Valvoline Rapid Oil. And then he ended up sell, selling it to, to Valvoline. Okay, uh, we find, uh, find out that the Ford's going to have all these electric cars, and we asked them, uh, you know, all the, the money for building roads is coming from gasoline taxes, right? Well, where's the money with no gasoline, no taxes? Well, how, how are they going to build roads? Uh, by the miles you drive. Well, how are they going to know that? And this is the answer that astounded me. We know it already. <laughs> okay. It, Scary. And, and um, <laughs> two, two, two things on that. No, number one is I got home and I've got a, a 19, uh, excuse me, 2016 Subaru and a 2018 Chrysler Pacifica. All of them, both of them, are sending me monthly reports about your engine condition, if you need oil change, what's your air pressure, and the number of miles that you take. Exactly. So they know it. Now the government's just got to get their you know, <laughs> hands on it and then they can send you a bill. But it comes out, nothing is free on the internet. It's what one of the people says, hey, you, know, you may think it's free, Google's free, you know, and everybody likes free stuff out there. Uh, <clears throat> So what we heard, and, and um, Facebook like, lets tons of companies get information to you, including Amazon, Netflix, and Microsoft. Very ironically, I looked at the internet this morning, and it is that Facebook is getting fined $5 billion for releasing private information by the government. Uh, Google sells personal data. Apple and IBM, they call their own, on Ford, are, are, are ethical. So they, they don't release that. So it's something to remember. Now, it's, they're probably telling you that they're, they're selling it, but it's in that 20-page fine print thing you get, the, you get the, when you say accept, when, when you take, take their service. Uh, Self-driving cars are coming soon. I've got a, a couple of video, uh, some videos here I'm going to get to. I can do it. This is, let's see, there we go. The world is beginning to notice Subaru okay. EyeSight, offering greater peace of mind and convenience. Mm -hmm. Our models with the Subaru EyeSight driver assist technology receive the highest possible rating for front crash prevention from IIHS. Like a second pair of eyes for the road ahead, EyeSight is a set of four technologies that warns you when there's potential danger and can even apply brakes to help you avoid it. Pre-collision braking can help prevent rear-ending the car ahead. As the car is in motion, EyeSight is constantly watching and gauging the distance to objects within its field of view ahead. Let's say that the car ahead suddenly slows down. EyeSight analyzes the closing speed and will sound an alert and flash a visual warning if there's the danger of a collision. If the driver doesn't hit the brakes, EyeSight will do it for you, applying the brakes automatically, bringing the car to a full stop if necessary. Pre-collision throttle management can help avoid accidentally accelerating into something ahead. Suppose the Subaru is stopped behind another car, waiting to merge onto a busy highway and looking for a space in traffic. With EyeSight, if the Subaru driver starts to accelerate, thinking the car ahead is already gone, the system can spot the danger and dramatically reduce the throttle to limit the car's acceleration. At the same time, it lights up a warning on the dash and sounds an alarm to alert the driver to the vehicle ahead. EyeSight can significantly cut the throttle, which will allow the driver more time to see the problem and stop the vehicle. Adaptive cruise control is there for those times when highway traffic doesn't flow smoothly. Like conventional cruise control, the driver activates the system and sets the speed with the steering wheel switch. But since traffic rarely travels at a constant pace, EyeSight adjusts with it. 
EyeSight will automatically maintain a set following distance, smoothly braking if traffic slows, and accelerating back up to the set speed when it clears. There's little need to modulate the brake and gas, just let EyeSight do the work. Adaptive cruise control will even work in stop and go highway traffic. When the car ahead brakes, EyeSight does too, right down to a standstill. Departure and sway warning alerts the driver if the car starts to drift from its lane. As the car is in motion, eyesight looks ahead, identifying lane markings on the road. If the vehicle begins to leave its lane without signaling, beeps will sound and a warning will appear on the dash to alert the driver so they can steer the car to correct its course. Drifting back and forth in a lane will also trigger eyesight to sound a lane sway warning. <coughs> Lane Keep Assist will step in to gently help steer the vehicle back into its lane. It will also sound a warning and flash a light in your side mirror when it senses your vehicle departing outside of the white lines. EyeSight is not a substitute for safe driving, but it will afford you an extra level of awareness. When the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety tested front crash prevention, Subaru models with EyeSight got the highest possible score. Not Toyota or Ford or any other brand. Subaru EyeSight. An extra set of eyes every time you drive. In addition to EyeSight, we've also developed two active safety features that offer further protection. Always looking to make our vehicles even safer, we developed Subaru Blind Spot Detection to help watch over your shoulder and warn you of potential danger. Available on most Subaru models, Blind Spot Detection uses radar sensors in the rear bumper to monitor your blind spot area. When blind spot detection senses that a vehicle in another lane is approaching or within your blind spot, a warning light will appear in your side mirror alerting you to that vehicle's presence. Lane Change Assist, another feature of this system, uses the same warning light when another vehicle on the right or left approaches at a higher speed in the neighboring lane. After the initial warning light displays, if you switch lanes or signal to change lanes, and Lane Change Assist senses that the approaching vehicle is still there, it gives you a flashing warning to further alert you to the vehicle's presence. Parking lots can also be tricky, even for the best of drivers. That's why we developed Subaru Th Rear this, Cross this I use and press to all help you in parking it's situations safe. where your vision is blocked all these are on my, my car and you can't see vehicles approaching. As you're backing out of a parking spot, keeping an eye out as you go, backing the radar out of spot sensors in the rear field. bumper of your Subaru are looking too. If rear cross traffic alert senses traffic approaching from either side as you are backing up, it will alert you with a flashing visual indicator and an audible warning, giving you time to stop and avoid any approaching danger. That extra awareness can really come in handy in situations like these. Together with EyeSight, Rear Cross Traffic Alert and Blind Spot Detection with Lane Change Assist deliver that extra convenience and peace of mind you've come to expect from Subaru. Ah, oh, they're on my car out there. I had a 2008 uh, Chrysler minivan and it had the blind spot warning on it. And after we used it, I said, I'm never going to buy a car that doesn't have it. And a lot of the companies didn't have it. And then Subaru did when I was looking to, to get my personal car. And the eye spot came with it. Uh, our new Chrysler's got the, the uh, variable uh, speed, speed control, uh, autonomous. Uh, uh, but uh, I would not buy a car without that. It's on my Subaru. My wife never thought she'd like it, but it's on the Chrysler and she loves it. Again, it's just like a dishwasher. Once you try it, you, <laughs> you, you love it. Now, I have one, one more short video in here I want to try to get to. This is basically using the adaptive cruise control in a commercial environment. The Federal Highway Administration's Turner Fairbank Highway Research Center demonstrated truck platooning technology. This innovation allowed three trucks to travel together as a cooperative adaptive cruise control platoon, or CACC platoon. 
CACC uses the radar sensors and electronic actuation of engine and brakes used by conventional adaptive cruise control systems available on today's vehicles. CACC adds vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications, enabling a smoother, closer following vehicle control system. For each truck in the platoon, the driver continued to steer while the CACC system controls speed adjustments. When one of the trucks detects a cut-in vehicle, it automatically slows down and opens the gap to a safe distance behind the cut-in vehicle. Then, readjusts the gap to the original distance when the cut-in vehicle leaves the platoon. Safety is enhanced using collision avoidance features like those available on vehicles now. This truck platooning technology demonstrated that CACC allows trucks to drive safely and smoothly at shorter gaps than they can under conventional manual driving. Potential benefits include better utilization of the highway through increased throughput, improved fuel economy, and lower operating costs. In five years, they'll take the driver out of those trucks. I'll be out. I'll be out of that. And they're not saying that on here, but that's that's what's going to happen. Uh, so I want to add. There is a self-driving cars can mean a, a lot of a lot of things. What's the definition of self-driving cars? The industry has adopted a five-part scale on it. Number one is basically the is person what you have right now. You're driving the car, the devices assist the driver. Like the blind spot warning does, the backup warning assists the driver. The second one is partly automated driving. Systems can also take control, but the driver remains responsible for doing the good. Adaptive cruise, cruise control. Yeah. There's an automatic parking feature on our, on our minivan. Um, the, the pre-collision braking, yeah. The first part of that Subaru was all this kind of stuff. And most manufacturers have them today. They didn't three or four years ago, but they did today. The next one is highly automated driving. In certain situations, the driver can disengage the driving for extended periods of time. Tesla offers that. They say it's on their cars, but they can't you can't turn the switch on until they get some highway you know, state authorities to do it, but the rumor is uh, the salesman knows how to do it, and if you're nice to him, he will do it for you, and you go out and have Tesla drive. Number four is fully automated driving. The driver, the driving, the vehicle drives independently most of the time. The driver must remain able to drive, but can't, for example, but can, for example, take a nap. So this is, if it's driving, a big snowstorm comes, you know, you're, you're going to have to wake up and drive. This one, number five, is no steering wheel. It's fully automatic. This is where Uber, are people familiar with Uber and Lyft? Yeah. Okay. This is where they want to be. Yeah, they're back over up, up in here you know, today. Now, where's Mavis back there? This is the one insurance companies are scared to death of, or, or, or automobile companies. The issue is who's driving the car. There, there, there's an example of a Tesla got into a little accident. Uh, there was a fender bender out in the, the California freeways, and <coughs> the police came up and asked the driver, you know, you know, have you been drinking? He says, yes, I have. So I wasn't driving the car, Tesla was. <laughs> I don't know that, that, that he, he, he got off on that, but <coughs> insurance companies don't know who, who's, who's going to be covered. You know, who, who, you're writing insurance for these kind of cars. Is it the manufacturer's fault, bad software, or is it the, the driver's fault? They get into here. This is all manufacturers up here. It's all all the drivers. Those are very one of the many problems that's, that's going to come in, in, in the future here. Uh, now I want to go and talk to Uber. Okay, and I want, I want to read this to you. And uh, uh, 
Uber is a new way of working. It's about people having the freedom to start and stop work when they want to and push of a button. Old style taxi companies are ideal villain. Taxi drivers, Uber proclaimed are oppressed workers. Being an Uber driver by contrast was sustainable and profitable. The company said drivers are uh, described as entrepreneurs with a median income of $74,000 in San Francisco and $90,000 in New York City. A Denver cabbie who switched to Uber was quoted, I feel emancipated. Okay, okay. next slide. <coughs> Federal Trade Commission found the claims to be false advertising. The company agreed to pay $40 million. <laughs> uh, again, uh, Uber is coming out with a hundred uh, Billion dollar. Well, I'll talk. This is Silicon Valley. About investing in Silicon Valley. It's always been a lottery where immense wealth is secured by a few. Everybody else about hope, hope for for good luck. Really, however, has the disparity been on such a stark display as with Uber? Uber stock market value is expected to be about a hundred billion dollars, which would make one of the richest Silicon Valley's offerings. Okay, that offering. Um, Uber wants to distract investors from huge losses and slowing growth by dangling the promise of self-driving cars. However, there's no reason to believe they would have an advantage and a chance of making money in this industry either. Facts are Uber is losing $1.8 billion a year. Uh, they're revealing an issue of public offering. Uber's plan to be a taxi company with driverless vehicles. They need $100 billion to tide them over until driverless vehicles are, are available. Don't know exactly when it's going to be here. The offering will be in May. If you want to buy a stock, call Jeremy or John. <laughs> uh, Silicon Valley business model, uh, and, it, and this is the way, the, the way they think out there. They want sales. This is, this is an Amazon uh, chart. Their sales have gone up, their profits have been very small. But Amazon initially, and I think they did it in the book business, came in with lots of sales at fairly low prices, <coughs> didn't make any money on it, but drew, drove the bookstores out of business when they started raising prices. Now Amazon, they made a little bit of money last year uh, they haven't made very much on their delivery service. They, they found out that, uh, and we visited Amazon, but they have a, a uh, Amazon uh, wireless product where they manage uh, um, internet sites for other companies. They made a ton of money on that. The reason it was started is that Amazon was so busy at Christmas time, they had to put in all these computers and they weren't being used, so they started using it and made that into a very profitable business. So, bets for the future. Okay. And these are the five take-home values. So if, if you guys get a test tomorrow, you get asked what happened to Kiwanis. <laughs> 50 years, electricity will be cheap. Almost 60% of the new cars will be electric by 2040. Nothing is free on the internet. Self-driving cars are coming soon, and Silicon Valley startups focus on growth, not profit. If you've got any questions, I can... So one of the, the big issue that comes up now with technology is like the um, stealing of information and the hacking and so forth. Did any of them talk like, if we're looking at driverless cars, the potential for massive damage that you have cars driving down the road and I can hack into her, I can hack into her bank accounts and taking her money. I can hack into her driverless her car and control the speed. You could I mean there's a lot of uh, they're looking at that. And that's all the companies in Silicon Valley are, are looking at that. They know that uh, vehicles have to talk with each other and they're arguing about which the software will, will talk with each other and the, everybody wants to promote those because then they can get royalties from other other companies for using it. And, uh, there's a thing that we talked about, blockchain, which is where you can send money. Uh, let me back up. You're talking about 
packing. Of course, Phil's not in the office. Here he is. Uh, this is a, um, two of our members have got hacked big time. And in both cases, they were transferring huge sums of money on business deals they did, they made. It was a wire transfer. And just before the wire transfer was made, they got an email from their attorney saying the customer has decided to change the bank in which they, they want the money deposited. So they did that and sent, sent the money to the new bank. Hmm. Never got to the customers out of the country within 20 minutes. One guy lost $250,000. So, and he would, he was, he didn't like to lose money. And he hired, you know, investigators and everything, but there's nothing they, they could do. Wow. Other than try and sue the lawyer, but <laughs> and, and the, the lawyer, it appears anyway, the lawyer got got hacked and didn't didn't know what and somebody was following what they were doing. Oh, wow. So the theory with Silicon Valley is that all these companies are gathered together because they don't want to miss out on something. Yeah. Okay. So do they? Who's talking? How how do they find out about each other? Just their employees talking to each other, well, or do well, they yeah, share? Well, yeah. Well, we we talk to at Ford, and you know everybody else is out there. Well, they have. You know, uh, engineers in the automotive, you know, business or or have s societies and, and organizations. Uh, sometimes it's down for, for local, you know, bar and, you know, and that kind of stuff. And they particularly want to know small companies that <coughs> might have it, have it made. You know, and, uh, and then they may go buy them. And, and you will see in the paper, I just got a, a friend of ours, <coughs> He's in the automotive industry, and he uh, works for a company called Rivian, where that was in the electric vehicles, basically pickup trucks and SUVs. Ford just made a, a $500 million investment in that company. It was announced yesterday, the, the, the day before. And they're actually going to make some vehicles for, for Ford, but that's a startup. Silicon Valley and these these big companies look at it and see if there's opportunity there, um, and like I was, there, they want to get the patents so they can make money from licensing it, and they they know, I think they know that there's there's four or five people that are in the programming business for self-driving cars, and probably one of Google's one of them, um, I think uh, Apple maybe and. Toyota and somebody, and you know, but one of them will probably be the winner. So, and the other thing is, up here we don't see very many self-driving cars. If you were in Phoenix, you're, you're in, are you in Arizona? Yeah. Well, they drive those Prius cars that are uh, to, to Toyotas. Yeah, you, they got the stuff on top and the, the yeah. driver sleeping. Yeah, and, they're running around. Okay, okay, yeah. So yeah, it's not going to come overnight. It's not going to turn the light on, but it's going to gradually be there. And mm -hmm. You guys can come back in 30 years and tell us if we were right or not. Come back if you want us in 30 years and tell us if we were right or not. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.